I had no idea the multitude of issues and challenges that digital health companies had to deal with. It's quite insane. Well, we're here to help. More importantly, the CEO and founder of Rock Health is here with a group of panelists to help make sure you aren't left not knowing what's important. Hallie Tepo is leading the charge for Rock Health, the incubator that is taking the healthcare world by storm. She was recently named by CNN as one of 12 entrepreneurs reinventing healthcare, as well as 15 women to watch in tech by In Magazine. By Inc. Magazine. I forgot to see. <laughs> Hallie, the stage is yours. Thank you, Jill, and thank you for having us at this wonderful event in San Diego. I love San Diego. Um, and the massages outside were an excellent touch. Thank you. So I am really excited to be here and to spend the next 50 minutes with all of you. We have an outstanding panel here of people that can um, help us think through the regulatory and financial hurdles that startups face, both from companies that are well-resourced um, to companies that just got funding and stealth companies. So we have some really wonderful, diverse perspectives, and I'll be asking them tough questions, and then really going out and asking you guys to talk about, or at least ask questions about things that are um, on your mind right now. So um, before I introduce our panelists, I actually thought it would be helpful for us to know a little bit about you guys, so that we can really tailor the conversation. So if we could just do a quick poll, um, how many entrepreneurs in the house? Two and a half. Investors, so really just a few investors. Um, corporate healthcare, okay. Providers, what am I missing? Payers. Payers, like you guys are corporate. <laughs> Payers. Technology development. Technology development, okay. Consumers. Well, everybody. <laughs> Consumers. Great. Um, so you guys, you know, keep that in mind as we're uh, talking here today. So I have um, to my left Greg LePeter from Qualcomm Life, um, and then Amy Shang is the co-founder of Cellscope, and Alex Go from a stealth startup called LiveWell. Um, and we're going to start by just doing quick introductions and talking about uh, where you guys are right now, and then we'll dig into some questions. Okay, I'm Greg LePeter with Qualcomm Life, and that says I'm chief counsel down there, so I'll be chief counsel. Um, <laughs> That said, I guess I should make two statements. One, uh, uh, the views I express here are not necessarily those of Fuck on Life. And uh, two, I reserve the right to take a position and then quickly change gears and take the other position and try to argue both persuasively. So I have about 10 years of experience in uh, medical device sales distribution. Uh, I have experience with GPOs as well uh, and uh, the informatics side uh, too, from well, privacy regulation. attachments to smartphones to enable a home diagnosis. And my background is really on the product development side uh, in the medical device industry. So I actually started uh, out of college uh, working at a class three uh, artificial heart company out of the New England area. And then I moved from that to a class two uh, hematology uh, blood analyzer uh, company uh, where I was managing a team of engineers to take this product to market, so taking it through the entire product development cycle, as well as the 510K process, um, getting it cleared, uh, and then uh, pushing it out uh, through OEM partnerships. Um, from there, I actually went to an academic lab at UC Berkeley, um, and we started working on Cellscope, which is the combination of cell phones and microscopes to be able to do a remote diagnosis. So we're looking at uh, remote diagnosis of diseases like TB and malaria in developing countries. Um, and then about a year ago, we spun a startup out of the lab, uh, and that's Cellscope, um, where we're working on um, attachments for doing home diagnosis. Uh, one of the first products is a home otoscope. So anyone who, who's a parent and has kids uh, knows that one of the most common reasons you take your child to see the doctor is for a suspected ear infection. And uh, we felt that this was something that could really be pushed from the hospital environment into the home. So the future that we envision is really mom and dad from the comfort and convenience of home being able to slip onto their, their iPhone, a simple attachment, you know, download our app, and then be able to take a high quality image at home and transmit it to a doctor for that uh, remote diagnosis. Um, so that's, that's our plan uh, for the next year is to get a product out to market. 
Afternoon, my name is Alex Go. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Live Well Health. This is uh, startup number two for me. Um, prior to this, uh, I've had experiences working for Tyco for about 10 years in the electronics business, as well as uh, 10 years with Intel uh, Corporation to, uh, in their healthcare sector, um, uh, the most notable of which uh, we uh, developed a telehealth system. So we went through the whole class to uh, medical device environment. Uh, I had a team that uh, called on the commercial payers as well as insurance delivery, uh, uh, integrated delivery networks. Um, we uh, launched uh, Live Well Health uh, with, uh, with the intent to uh, offer two things. One is uh, consultating services to assist uh, industries such as assisted living kind of transform their business. So if you know the assisted living facilities uh, operator market, it's all very much about building revenue as, as soon as a resident moves in. Um, as, uh, as a growing need, uh, as we all know, uh, of uh, seniors desiring to remain at home and age independently, um, there's a, a, a stronger pull to build strategies around campus extensions. And so uh, part of that uh, product is that we're offering consultating services to uh, large operators uh, that serve the senior market. And then the second part of it is really a, a platform play where we would uh, repurpose existing technologies uh, in the market today and make it easier to use for both uh, seniors and family caregivers. And where is everybody based? San Diego. San Francisco. San Francisco. Great, so we are completely biased towards West Coast. Apologies, anyone from the East Coast. Um, so it sounds like uh, we have a, a really great diversity of panelists and you guys might have some specific thoughts around digital health versus kind of med tech and you guys have all kind of been in the, this space for a while. Um, in kind of broad terms, what do you think are the biggest differences, both opportunities and challenges of M health and digital health and the idea of kind of the software component versus more traditional med tech? Alex, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, we see uh, within uh, Live Well Health, we, we see that there's a lot of innovation in the space that's happening already. Um, I love uh, uh, Jody's tagline, what's your 50 plus strategy? Well, you see a lot of innovation on the uh, mobile health side, uh, predominantly around tools to make uh, providers more efficient or maybe uh, wellness driven type of applications. Um, what, what we look at is we're, we're looking beyond that and say, well, can we repurpose existing technologies and instead build a business, a sustainable business uh, value proposition around it and apply it towards uh, industries that are uh, in need, right? So uh, on the mobile health side, uh, we definitely see the uptake in uh, iPads, even in senior communities. That's a huge uh, adopter uh, over the last year. Um, whether you're a family member buying an iPad for your loved one, parent, um, or you're, you've got senior community centers that actually have iPad classes to teach folks how to get connected and bridge that di digital divide. So uh, with that socialization aspect will come uh, a lowering of the uh, technology averse to be more technology aware and hopefully more accepting. Uh, and it'll help us introduce strategies that Dr. Migliori described um, to help proactively manage their care, right? 65 plus or 70, you're managing three or four chronic illnesses at the same time. That 5% of the population is driving 50% of the healthcare costs in spending today. Maybe you can touch upon um, the development process, and Greg, you can talk about kind of the legal sure. ecosystem. Sure. Uh, so from our perspective, speaking for Celsco, you know, we think mobile health is, is Amazing. I mean, to be able to leverage something as powerful as a smartphone. So, with our attachments, we're we're building optical attachments where we are really leveraging the power of the smartphone. So we are taking advantage of the smartphone's camera, the LED, um, and transforming it into an, an incredibly useful device. Um, so, in terms of the, the product development cycle, you know, my perspective of coming from more traditional medical device development, you know, everything. Took a, there, it just took a lot longer, whereas now the speed to market to be able to get something out there can be much faster because of the ability to leverage you know, the sensor that's, that's in your pocket, the, the iPhone camera that's just getting better and better. Um, and it also enables us to make um, attachments that are actually very low cost, 
Um, in our case, uh, our devices don't are passive. They don't have batteries. They don't have circuit boards in them. Um, and like I said, we're really uh, piggybacking off of uh, the power of the smartphone. And then from my perspective, I think one of the two of the challenges that uh, that uh, I didn't necessarily hear. Uh, I know that you had an early adopter on the cl on the clinical side, but I think. Um, Overcoming clinician reticence uh, to the use of the mobile application is, is something that I think that's a, a practical challenge. But from a regulatory standpoint, to borrow a West Coast analogy, uh, where, where is the regulation going to go? And uh, what are you going to have to do to comply in the future with your intended use of your device? And uh, so where is that way? When is it going to peak? And how can you get your surfboard on? And that, that to me is real, uh, it's a real challenge. We were lucky at Qualcomm Life because the regulations kind of fell into play as we were developing the technology. The MDDS class one medical device data system. So we can just port data from a medical device to the cloud and then to an interface that the clinician or the user themselves can, can see. But with mobile apps, I think we're still waiting to hear from the FDA uh, on some final guidance uh, documents. And uh, with, this, with this election year, I'm not sure if we're going to get anything out of them uh, anytime soon. So I think finding the regulatory uh, that applies, the regulatory uh, regime that applies to your product and then trying to fit your product development cycle even into that regime and make sure you have a full quality system that matches wherever the FDA lands, even on a class one general con controls device, is a real challenge. The other challenge, I think, is when I reference clinicians uh, initially, is reimbursement. So how are you going to get your device paid for if it's not a consumer play? If you're trying to get it into the hospital setting and you don't have an appropriate code or, or have a physician's office with a CPT code, you're going to have some a real challenge in, in getting uptake of that device initially. Actually, that, that was one of my next questions. So let's dig into the who pays question. Um, but first, kind of wanted to summarize what I heard. Um, so Alex, it really sounded like the business opportunities in digital health were even stronger and more exciting than traditional med tech. Amy, I heard it's actually easier to get to market, easier to develop these products, because you already have this really sophisticated sensor device that's in your pocket, and you're really um, working on the ancillary products. Um, and then Greg, you were a little less optimistic. And it sounded like, because the FDA hasn't really put out the standards, there's only the draft guidelines, um, we're unsure how they're gonna feel about digital health. So it could be good, yeah, it could be tricky. We might have to wait until things settle down in the White House. Correct, I'm, I'm, I'm a cynical idealist, I guess. Great, great, okay. Um, so uh, you, can, you can leave now. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, so let's talk about money because I think that's the, the, the biggest question that we hear at Rock Health is, so innovation is great, we're really excited to see all these technologies, um, but, but how are they going to be around in five years? What's the model of sustainability and making money? Um, so maybe Alex and Greg, um, or actually um, Alex and Amy, you guys can talk of from the startup point of view, how much pressure you guys have had to really prove out your business model before receiving investment. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <It's laughing. laughs> uh, and then, and then, Greg, maybe you can talk about some of the startups that you guys work with. Qualcomm works with dozens of startups in wireless health. How you guys vet them for sustainability? Sounds good. Um, so we are seed funded today, and uh, I probably had I don't know twenty different VCs talk that reached out to us and talked to me probably over the last nine months, just just to put a frame of mind. And everyone's poking. There's so much money on the sidelines because what they want to see are um, a a business model that you now have validated because, okay, you, you think your adoption is going to be this and here's the data to show it. And what are you going to do with all that money if we were to give it to you uh, to be able to scale it, right? And so we often get, uh, and then so what, what we did on, in order to get to the, validate the business model as quickly as possible was we made the strategic decision of we're not going to necessarily invent some core technology or code. Instead, we're going to repurpose what's available out in the marketplace and, in fact, create a solutions integration type of approach. Uh, because the whole premise was if we can improve the business model using an off the shelf suite of solutions, then it's a lot easier to then say, okay, now that we've proved the consumer willingness to go pay, uh, let's go ahead and cost optimize the overall solution with a bucket of money. So, I mean, that's mentally how we're framing the. Uh, how do we get funding? How do we raise funding quickly? How do we demonstrate uh, proof points so we can have a bigger access to funds? And you said consumers are paying. It's not yes. the system? 
That's right. How so, much are consumers paying? How much so for you us, um, so the, and then we have to go, I'll frame that with a uh, context. One of our uh, uh, targets is to offer a suite of services in lieu of having your parents live in assisted living. So many of you know that assisted living here in the U.S. is predominantly born out of pocket, three to five thousand dollars per month, and it cripples not just parents but also the families that are attached to that parent. It's a, it's a big deal. And so our model is around, hey, how do we deliver the similar level of care, not necessarily the full-time aspect of assisted living for independent seniors um, that might be managing chronic illnesses at less than 10% of the price structure, right? So how do you make that more accessible in the home, delivered to the home? So our model is, yes, we're gonna justify it around delivering services that similar to what you might receive in assisted living um, for less than 10% of the price using technology. Um, so yes, for us, we, we pitch to a lot of investors and one of the most common questions is what is your business model? And finally, uh, we answered with it's, it's evolving um, and it still is, um, but you know, our strategy is really a direct-to-consumer model um, with the Home Otoscope. Um, we have, we get inquiries all the time from parents, from doctors, pediatricians, med students um, who are very interested in having a device like ours, um, which is, you know, which enables that digital record that currently doesn't exist with the standard Otoscope, um, being able to get second opinions, being able to transmit um, the image. Um, so, you know, when we go out and look at what's currently available, um, the options aren't great. So you can either take your child into the ER or the um, make a schedule an appointment to go uh, see the pediatrician, and all of it just so the pediatrician can take a quick peek in your kid's ear. Um, and uh, the other, there are on the other spectrum, there are options. You can go to Amazon.com and you can buy a cheap otoscope for like twenty-five dollars. Um, but like I said it's not that helpful to a parent because what are you looking for? How do you know what to look for? Um, and then there's no way to capture an image and actually send it. So we're kind of we're filling, filling that niche in between. And um, kind of the, in terms of the payment model, uh, what we envision is um, charging a per diagnosis fee to the parent, um, roughly the amount of the copay, so 30 to $40, um, and then reimbursing the uh, physician uh, directly for the time spent reviewing the image and the data. Um, of course, it ultimately, you know, we think that telemedicine um, is moving towards getting reimbursement, but we think, you know, in the interim, a direct consumer model works very well for us. And so it sounds like both of you guys have models based on um, efficiencies, yeah. using technology to make a process more efficient. Have you guys talked to the payers, and what has been their response to this? Uh, I'll, I'll put it in context to my previous experience when I was at Intel. I, I think a lot of the uh, payers, including United, uh, are all trialing different types of telemedicine, tele, telehealth type of technologies. They've got pilots run across the country, right? All the tier ones are doing it. And, uh, and so uh, at this stage, we made a conscious effort um, as a startup to not get involved and go after payers. It's an automatic, let's go talk to the payer or let's go talk to the local Kaiser hospital system or whoever it may be. Um, but we said, you know what, we, we think that uh, our goal is we wanna go find niche markets that are either industries in crisis like assisted living that are wanting to extend uh, their reach into the uh, campus communities, um, or uh, potentially concierge positions that are aligning their incentive structures uh, and leveraging our service, right? Those are the ones that we believe will first be the early adopters of the service uh, on a co-branded model. So we're, we're staying away from payers for now. I think uh, three to five years when things stabilize on the healthcare reform front or uh, as they prove out different types of technologies, uh, that'll get warmer and hopefully turn into a hybrid model. What about Medicare? Uh, Medicare is, uh, I don't know, we'll see. Nope, not at all. So we're gonna try to talk to everyone, but, uh, but we're fortunate in the fact that we're not a pure startup even though we, we try to act like a startup. Um, I think, there's two couple things that I heard uh, from the prior response. One was that this concept of you go to the payers and, 
and they're, they're putting some more money in the game, and we have some our preparers and providers here for help. Um, and the concept, no matter what happens in the Supreme Court and with ACA, the whole concept of the accountable care organization, people going at risk and trying to reduce the cost of care and, and moving it out of maybe the institutional-based care, the acute care facility that's most expensive and outside of the hospital to, to the home is something that I think is one of those niche markets that will not no longer be a niche. I think it'll just be uh, the way we, we conduct healthcare in the future. Um, and then you had asked earlier how we how we vet people to that we try to embrace and enable their technologies to enter into that ecosystem so they can transmit the data out of um, the home and to to the providers. Um, we, we see people come approaching us in all shapes and forms. We see people that don't have a 510k device approved yet, but we're still engaging with them. Uh, they you know they've applied and and and, and whatnot. And we have much larger players that are approaching this. And, and they really seem to be, when we started, I think we thought that the business model would be that the medical device manufacturers themselves would approach us because either they weren't good enough at developing the software for the uh, remote, um, for the cellular capability, or, or two, they just didn't want to be bothered with it and wanted to outsource it. And we're seeing a little bit of both. And I think what we're doing is, it, it's transitioned a little bit. And it's gone away from our primary customer being the medical device manufacturer fulfilling that need for them to being approached by service providers who are going to the ACOs or going to the providers and they want a solution for like some of the metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, and treating the patients uh, that are in their homes with a, a cluster of devices that are enabled with our technology to uh, sync up the, the biometric data and put it on one platform and, and deliver it to the provider or to the patient. So that's, that's what we've been observing. You guys, you guys have worked with some of the most interesting wireless health companies, AliveCore, Airstrip, um, Duo Fertility. Uh, there are a lot of startups here that want to know how they can work with Qualcomm. Can you give us an idea of your, if, if there is a checklist, if there are certain uh, milestones a startup should reach before re um, coming to you guys? Are there, do they just show up at the sure. party, get Rick drunk? What get, is get on stage with you guys? <laughs> have, have, have a, well, yeah, I wasn't invited to the party, so I guess that's off the table. But. Um, but certainly having a device, one, uh, having it cleared uh, would be ideal. And then the other part would be having some sophistication on the in engineering level uh, on the software side uh, that would enable like either an API interface or uh, like an SDK, having, having those already pre-prepared or pre-packaged so that setting up a linkage to communicate with the, with the wireless that's enabled in your device already is a, a much simpler solution. That, that to us has, has been becoming a long pole on uh, getting people boarded uh, because of the variety of, of, of expertise that the manufacturers that are approaching us have when it comes to the pure engineering standpoint. And not only that, but please don't you know, approach us with spec one and then you know, have plans for two months later to go to you know, uh, 1.2 because cause we want somebody who's got a very uh, stable platform uh, for delivering um, their, their, their therapy that we can sync up to and, and so that it's not a lot of re-engineering re all over again. So one more question for you. So Qualcomm supports um, you know, in emerging businesses through investments, through hooking them up with the TuneIn platform, through um, you know, distribution. Yeah, you'll, you'll probably hear more from, uh, from Jack yeah. tomorrow. So but my, my question was, um, what other corpora corporations are you seeing that are getting really <coughs> engaged with early stage organizations? Uh, who are our competitors? It doesn't <laughs> have to be in your space. No. Um, are, there other, are there other entities that you guys are kind of looking to to build this process? Because to, to work with startups is a, is a lengthy yeah. process. There's a vetting process. There's getting them up off the ground. There's the risk that the startup won't be there in six months. Um, so, 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 so there is kind of an emerging industry in like technolo technology consulting. Uh, but I think what's really been interesting to me, having been in traditional like class two medical devices and GPOs and, and working with institutions themselves, is that it. The, the, the service, the, the, the service models are really becoming quite adaptive and quite creative, uh, just like what we heard here with the uh, assisted living. And I think, th I think on the service side, you'll actually see innovation on the service side that will really drive to, uh, to, to drive efficiency into the system and try to drive out costs. And depending upon how successful they are, that will determine where they end up. So I mean, I, the, one of the biggest advantages of um, kind of either creating a joint venture or working closely with a large organization is to help distribute your product. Um, so for the entrepreneurs, uh, can you guys talk about how you're gonna actually get into the channel? I mean, Amy sounds like 
Um, you said maybe it, it'll take a year to get on the shelves. Do you partner with a large organization that's the CPG company that can get it on the shelves, or is that something that you just kind of slowly go through the process of, of gearing up for? Yeah, I think, I think the plan for us is to initially uh, you know, sell it, start slow and scale up appropriately, but to uh, sell direct on our website, um, you know, to see how things are going, make sure, you know, be able to control that, that launch and that release. Um, you know, more and more uh, startups are also uh, selling their products through Amazon, so there are ways to kind of do that initially, um, and then find the appropriate partners. Um, you know, we would love to be in retail, like in the Apple Store or in Walgreens, um, and we have started talking to um, some of those partners, um, but the discussions are still fairly early. But I think it is important to to start those discussions early and kind of keep keep the communication lines open throughout the process. So that when it is time to really engage, um, you've already developed relationships with them. Yeah. Uh, on my side, uh, we actually um, have already partnered with some select channel partners. Um, even though we haven't yet um, have a final product to actually ship it to patient homes, we pulled uh, one or two strategic partners as channel partners to help us define exactly and refine which capabilities to roll out first. Uh, and so, an example I'll use would be uh, in the concierge practice side, uh, we've partnered with one company uh, that has five concierge positions sprinkled across the U.S. And their whole model is very much about holistic, right? So you talk about innovation. Well, guess what? You not only have the uh, primary care physician involved, but now you have a very business savvy and entrepreneurial primary care physician that is incentivized to provide uh, premium services to uh, select clientele, and they'll be, they're willing to adopt technology, and they have the, the right economics and incentive structure to do it. What we're doing is we're helping them in the transformation process, in building in this module, because they, they know how to do primary care, they know how to serve patients in their physical offices. They don't yet understand how do they bridge the gap now to extend that brand as well as the service into their patients' homes. So that's what we do. So we'll say, okay, well, let us help you do that. And you help us understand what feature set is really of value to help your business uh, be a, even more of a leadership opportunity. With similar uh, game plan for the assisted living facility sector, right? We've got two or three that uh, we're in term sheet level now to say, hey, look, uh, we're gonna go develop this widget and this platform uh, we're going to use off-the-shelf components now. We want to go test it out this summer. We want to deploy it inside your communities as well as build it in as part of your business processes to say, hey, you know what, if you're not ready to move in, and 95% of the time after they make the tour, they're not ready to move into the facility yet, just get started on this service that we can start uh, engaging with you in your home. Use your iPad to do the video coaching, um, and it's free. I mean, that's an example model of offering better service, uh, increasing access, and we're driving a pipeline of future potential residents for them. So. Thank you. So in technology, there's this concept of MVP, minimum viable product. So push something out that's bare bones, see how users respond, iterate, and do it quickly, and really take feedback from your beta users to refine the product and you know, eventually get to a point where it's a a fully robust site or, or, or software product. Um, you really can't do that in healthcare because people's lives are at stake and you might have the FDA um, you know, gearing in. So I would be curious to hear from your guys' perspective how startups can best build products um, and really balance out getting something to market quickly um, and building something that people will actually use. So not keeping it under wraps for a year until it's done and then realizing no one wants to use it, but getting kind of feedback safely throughout the development process and what sort of processes you guys are using. Well, what I would recommend is that any startup from, from day one just have a sense of uh, just the general controls on the quality system that you have to have for an FDA listing. And uh, that, that basically means you know, document what you're doing correctly as soon as you can. Don't go, you're going to have to go back and reinvent the wheel in order to get your clearance. Uh, if you haven't been doing that. So, I mean, sounds simple, but uh, take a look at the, the, the 21 CFR 20, the safety 
uh, documentation and regulations and uh, oh, I'm sorry uh, it's just the 21 CFR 20 I think is the quality system manual that, that you'd want to take a look at um, and uh, and what that does is it really it describes the safety system that uh, you'd have in place in your life cycle uh, and product development For software uh, I believe it's a little different there's 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 different things if you're going to go global there is an additional uh, software development um, I don't believe it's an ISO standard, but it's a medical device directive standard for uh, software lifecycle development. And so there's some additional requirements there if you're going to go to to the EU. Yeah, I would I would second that. I think you know, having come from a traditional med device um, background and going into a mobile health startup, um, I think whether or not you're uh, regulated by the FDA, I think there are some really good practices that you can you can learn from, and you know, one of them in for developing you know, safe, and, um, safe medical products is establishing uh, design control. And basically what that means is, you know, it, at my previous company, it was, there was literally a one-page um, checkoff list, and it broke down the development process into four phases. Um, and so it was kind of like a roadmap for the whole team. So you would know, you know, you would just whip out your one-page summary, and at any point you would know where you are in that process. So starting from, you know, breadboard feasibility. So that kind of addresses your question of how do you early on, you know, figure out what are the critical, you know, inputs that, that users want, what are the, the design requirements that you need, um, really getting out of the building and, and getting that information. So with Cellscope, um, you know, we're doing a home otoscope. It, it's, it is helpful that I have a 15-month-old child, so I, I am <laughs> one of the users that we're targeting. Um, so that's certainly helpful. I can um, <laughs> I, my husband and I can do some, you know, tests on our child at home. We can also, you know, I, my founders and I, we do a lot of testing on each other's ears, trying to make sure we get good images. So you, you just, you get creative and you figure out ways um, to get the information that you need. I spend a lot of time um, talking to my girlfriends who have kids and getting feedback. Um, but kind of going back to the, the kind of, I think, good practices that you can take from uh, medical device industry that design control process, I think if you get the whole team, you know, just aware of as a framework, you know, this is the development process. You know, if you're dealing with hardware, you, you start with breadboard, then you have to go to engineering prototypes, then manufacturing prototypes, then pre-pilot, and then pilot into saleable product. And what are all the kind of steps along the way if, you know, if you have software, there's that whole process. And getting people into the a good habit of, um, having periodic design reviews, documenting those, um, bug tracking, I mean, these are all things that are critical and I think they're, they're really important um, for startups to have, um, like I said, whether or not you're regulated. Um, and then that way you kind of develop your team to, to establish good habits so that you, know, you, don't, you don't end up doing all this work and then find out, oh, I actually forgot to do a design review past six months or a year, I forgot to document all this. Um, and you know, the, the term they use in the industry is um, developing your design history file. So it's literally like you can go pull out a drawer and you've got folders for, from phase one all the way through phase four, and anyone can go in and see you know, what's your product spec, what's your um, verification and validation documentation. If you're doing a 510K, you know, all of your protocol, all your data, um, all of that is in there, and it's filed kind of in this very neat and organized kind of chronological order that makes sense um, from the development perspective. I was just going to add, you know, my experience in the, the, the tail end of this, right, when we were launching a medical device, um, it was really about documentation, <laughs> but uh, reg uh, understanding what potential claims you want to go make so that you can reflect the test profile, you know, as well as all of the changes, uh, the DHF uh, uh, was extremely important purely because, uh, hey, you know, that impacts a lot of your risk assessment scores and mitigation strategies. Uh, and then I, I will add uh, to that is that um, it would really help when I was driving the uh, sales organization that we got pulled in earlier before we even started filing the uh, 510K because then it helped us understand the, the, especially from a legality aspect, from a general counsel aspect, us to understand what claims we, sh we are allowed versus not allowed to do. Understanding the whole marketing around the medical device side is 
is a big deal, right? So, uh, you know, it, it really helped from an education and buyout process. It made it really smooth. Great, so I'm gonna ask you guys to um, give me a quick little summary and then we'll open up for questions. So what are you most excited about in digital health? And Alex, I want you to talk about from you know business model opportunity, um, Amy from product, and Greg, sorry, but from regulatory or just legal point of view. Uh, one thing that gets you really, uh, gets you really excited and, and um, really convinced that this is uh, a, a new age for technology in healthcare. Sure. Um, I think this is uh, the first time where uh, I've been in the industry for about over 20 years now, right? Uh, where we have so much innovation that's actually happening, and it's so much easier to get a company off the ground, off and running, validate the business model, and really dramatically uh, drive costs, overall solution costs, and access to care in orders of magnitude. Um, and you don't need to be uh, all due respect, a Qualcomm to go do it. You could be an innovative entrepreneur going through the Rock Health program or whatever it may be. Uh, and you can, ha you can have an ability to touch a million lives. And we, internally, we always say, how do we build a product, a service that can touch a million lives? It doesn't have to be 10. It doesn't, uh, you know, 10,000 isn't enough, but how do we touch a million lives in the next two or three years? That's, that's important for us. And it's reasonable, it's achievable. I think for me, it's really, I get excited um, coming from the, the, the consumer, the, the patient perspective. I can think even recently, you know, I was sitting in the pediatrician's office um, for my child's checkup, and um, the pediatrician was running behind by half an hour. I'm sitting there with my child. He's getting really antsy and fussy. And the whole time, I'm, and I'm like on my phone checking my email for work, and I'm thinking, there has got to be a better way. Like, it does not have to be like this. You know, I wish I had been text messaged and told, you know, doctors running half an hour behind, please don't waste your time and come. And even more so, taking it one step further, how awesome would it be if I could have just been at home and like taken a couple of minutes and snapped a picture of my child, taken a video of my child and the ear, transmitted that one with some data. Um, and I think that's the future. I mean, it's coming, whether, whether we like it or not, it's gonna be here. And, you know, CellScope, you know, we're just one part of it. You know, we're working on um, developing a pipeline of products, starting with the home otoscope. But there's so many other interesting startups um, also taking advantage of the smartphone, doing really interesting and clever things. And um, I really think that, you know, that, that is the future. And, you know, I can't wait for it to be here. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to it. But no, from a regulatory standpoint, I think that the technology so far outpaced the ability of the of the regulators to, to get a, to really get ahead of it. And there, there's so many mobile apps out there right now. And, but but the, the agencies are being responsive. They, they do see the issue. And you know these these things aren't going to be just for talking and taking pictures anymore. I mean that's just it's got to be the reality. And um, and I think even even the SEC. Uh, as we talk about the smartphones, even the FCC has kind of reinvigorated their effort on the mobile health space. And even one of our uh, one of my peers at Qualcomm, Robert Jaron, has been uh, appointed as a as a kind of a key driver of that initiative to reinvigorate where we, where we are going in this space. So I think you know um, the regulations be what they may, and so maybe some there's, there's some pain of, of of trying to fit within the regulations. But certainly on the quality standpoint, I think we both agree that that they have other. Uh, unintended or intended consequences in, in that fact that you're putting out, you have good systems and you're putting out a quality product time after time after time. But uh, I think the regulations will, 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 will catch up and I think they'll enable, you know, allow for the creativity and, um, and the startups to continue to, to have a, a play in space, which I think is, is a good thing. All right, so I'm the only one with the microphone, so I'm gonna come around if we have some good questions. All right. Makes me feel like a talk show host. <laughs> All right. And your name? Uh, Thomas Lee. From where? Roche. And what's your question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of headaches, uh, I would say that competition can be one of the headaches. <laughs> so I'm interested to hear from Qualcomm's perspective as well as startup perspectives, two aspects. <coughs> What are the different categories of companies that you have seen in the digital health space? And then uh, maybe name one company in each 
category that excites you? Okay, um, so I think, so the comp comp categories of companies that are, that are playing in this space, as I said before, I think that there, there are these new service providers that are developing to, uh, even regional, to uh, address the need to drive costs out of care by taking uh, the treatment of, of, of the patient from being reactive to being proactive and, and monitoring the patient. So I think that's happening on the service provider level. I think on the mobile app application level, uh, there's just a crazy proliferation of mobile apps out there with uh, with applications not only for you know not not only for health and wellness or occupational health but for healthcare. So on the mobile application space, I think there's a play there. Uh, I think some of the other carriers uh, are looking at it. And I think um, there, there are products out there from like uh, services either like maybe a Verizon or AT and T. I think they're they're looking at the space. I think that large pharma. Is, is looking at the space as well to try to try to drive down clinical costs and, and how they're conducting the clinical trials for, for launching new drugs and products. Um, and then I think you know big 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 med tech is is there. They they've got to be there. And um, those are some just general categories that I, I I've seen just by being at Qualcomm. Uh, companies I'm excited about. Um, I'm excited about there, there there are a lot of companies that are really trying to tackle. Um, and as I said, I mentioned this cluster of companies before, but they're really trying to tackle some of the big cost and uh, debilitating issues of our day, and that's uh, hypertension and diabetes. And so, you know, you have you have companies out there with uh, glucose meters that are now Bluetooth enabled, uh, soon to be like Bluetooth low energy, uh, and you're going to have uh, some of the pulse oximeters that are really available, blood pressure monitors that are readily available. So, they're, without naming specific names, I think those, those silos they just make sense. It, uh, they, I think that's it's a great play, and they just make a lot of sense. Thank you, Greg. I think we have another question back here. And your name? Omari Starks. And you're from Practice Fusion. Yes. Awesome. Uh, so just a um, question statement. So uh, earlier uh, it was mentioned about uh, MVP and um, whether or not it was a good idea, if you will. Uh, my question is, can't you just A-B test some functionality of the product as opposed to the whole product and releasing it? Um, yeah, that's about it. Alex, can you answer that for us? Uh, just a real quick recap, but like MVP, or is, can you repeat the? Uh, the MVP, so we were talking earlier about building kind of the minimum bare bones product ah. in technology, and can you do that in healthcare? And the question was, well, can't you just put the product live and do some A-B testing, so see, have one group see one version of the site or the yeah. product, and another group see another? So th there's two aspects to this, and I'll just anchor on uh, what uh, Amy had described earlier, is that it de depends on what product somebody is uh, deploying to the marketplace. If it's a medical device type product, and your strategy is you're going to need to go through, your plan is to get through an FDA 510K type of clearance. There's very stringent limitations, and FDA publishes guidelines of what you can and can't do. Uh, if, you can, you, if you want to go do a trial, uh, there's an IRB process that you may want to go through, not may, you're required to go through. Um, if it's a non-medical device, if it's a, it's a uh, software or communications type platform, certainly that's, there's, you know, there's plenty of beta type opportunities to download that, try it for freeware. And if it makes sense, then for us, you know, we would go monetize that in some shape or form, right? So, Part of the things that we are doing this summer is, is to go do a, a series of beta or pilots uh, uh, to do two things. One is to go test out the business model uh, and engagement. And then the second one is to guide which feature sets we really believe uh, uh, actual users will use, right? So it's about the engagement level. So that's kind of a part of our strategy. Another, another strategy would be if you are going to do a clearance with the FDA on the Type and K is uh, keep two things in mind. I mean, really delve into the other filings that are out there uh, and that are in related spaces. Uh, uh, you can, I'm not gonna say it's amazing, but there, if you can rely upon the predicate device uh, filings that come before you for, for certain attributes, then that, that's something to perhaps consider. The other thing is when you are submitting your 10K, you know, be careful, very careful on how you're crafting it. And if you if you have an integrated system, are you gonna are you going to lock in that system as your 510K, or are you going to do certain components of that system uh, within, within the 510K? Uh, those are just other, other things to keep in mind. Do you have time for one or two more? Yeah. 
Two more? All right. We have? Mark. From? We've been through this. Um, Johnson & Johnson, it's nice <laughs> to be asking another question. Um, I had a question specifically. Um, I, I love your idea. I think it's phenomenal, the idea of using the iPhone device to attach something and then, you know, create this interactive experience with the physician, right? And I've heard of other companies doing something similar in the diabetes world, and it's just, it's, it's great. My question, though, is more about how do you create that um, experience that's, it, that's so vivid, it's so reliable, right, that the physician will be able to see this picture, understand fully what's going on, then feel comfortable to write a script or do it all via this one photograph, right? So I guess what I'm trying to understand is, is where do you see your product evolving to so that it can continue to answer these questions? Um, because I just, I guess, I, I wonder what will happen if, for example, the baby or whomever the child or the, the patient, right, is not, uh, okay, so it's not an ear infection, they're still crying, then what happens? Right, so how does that evolve? Right, um, so, are you, ask, are you asking more from the physician, kind of physician feedback, or the consumer, or can you, can you just clarify? Yeah, it sounded more like the, the diagnosis accuracy efficacy of CellScope. Okay. Right now, and what you're doing to make sure that it improves. Okay, yeah, so, I mean, we certainly, um, you know, when we talk to physicians, you get the whole spectrum. You know, you get, there are the physicians that are like, you know, we want to still touch and feel the patient, we want to see the patient. Um, but I think more and more there are, you know, this, this younger group of pediatricians coming on board that, you know, have iPhones that are very interested in um, this type, you know, being able to do this remote uh, diagnosis. Um, and so the way we have thought about trying to ensure as accurate the diagnosis as possible is um, things like you know getting a high quality image, so doing everything we can in the hardware and software development process to ensure that it's as simple to use for a minimally minimally to untrained mom. Um, thinking of things like um, having the mom maybe take a short little video clip, you know, so that you can kind of take away the need to get a precise image, um, and then have the doc review the video clip, can find that you know kind of image that it has the, shows the kind of key parts of the eardrum that the doc is looking for. Um, in addition to the image, um, inputting in, it through our app, kind of the, the basic patient symptoms and uh, history that the doctor is looking for. So they're not gonna be willing to make a diagnosis based just on an image, but they're gonna want some, you know, does your child have a fever, what other symptoms are there, um, and kind of looking that you know, together um, to make the diagnosis. And ultimately, the call is on the doctor. So, uh, you know, the way we see it, we provide as much good information to the doctor, and um, if they feel comfortable making the diagnosis, then they can, and if not, you know, then, you know, if the image is blurry or, or they, they just, they need more information, um, then, you know, they have, this, the, the diagnosis has been made, and we don't charge the consumer for that. Jill, am I fired? All right, last question. Uh, hi, this is Aiden Petrie. Um, we see a lot of technology coming out of uh, universities um, all over the country, and it seems that it can get halfway, a little bit down the road based on internal funding and the like, but then there's a long gap between internal funding and something that shows a degree of efficacy in the lab, and uh, a 510K, and I wonder how easy um, you found it or found it to bridge that financing gap to get to a 510K. So, you know, I, I completely agree with you. I think um, in my experience, you know, working in the lab environment on kind of the original form of cell scope when we were looking at remote diagnosis in developing countries, we were mostly grant funded. You know, from Gates Foundation, Vodafone, Intel, Microsoft, um, and then it, when, once we formed the company, the startup, um, there was kind of a, a this gap in, in funding, and um, that's where you know being a part of Rock Health's first class of startups that really helped us. Um, you know, having the, the space, getting grant money through them to kind of keep bootstrapping along. Um, and then finally, you know, going through the whole fundraising process, you know, I think it took finding the right investor who was willing to take a risk on us, on this early stage company, and um, give us a seed round, um, a, a 
fund funding. Uh, and you know, at this point, we're still, you know, a, a, a ways away from uh, doing a 510K. In our situation with the otoscope, uh, otoscopes are class one uh, 510K exempt. So you know, in terms of level of classification for the FDA, it's, it's the lowest. So that's good news for for us as a startup. But certainly, you know, needing to implement quality system and general controls and register with the FDA, all of that we still need to do. And you know, the, establishing all those good practices that I talked about before. Um, and so that's where you know, hopefully my industry experience, uh, I can take that and, and bring it to, to our mobile health startup. Sorry, I have to cut this short. I want to thank Hallie and all the uh, panelists today. It was a great session. And there's a couple things I want to just point out. One is in your workbook, um, Rock Health put together uh, a, a little booklet in there called Startup Elements. And uh, it's kind of like their ode to, um, their ode to the dummies guide. So I think it's